Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I want to thank the organizers for what's been a great workshop so far. It's, been, it's my first time in India, and it's been a, it's been a great time. Um, so this talk was originally titled Simple Algorithms for Noisy Missing and Corrupted Data, but the algorithms are so simple that I thought it would just be uh, better just to leave that out altogether. Um, so just noisy missing and corrupted data. This is a joint work with my student Yudong Chen at Austin and, uh, and a longtime collaborator Shai Manor who's at the Technion. Um, I'm glad that Chiru left because this talk actually is not going to be about robust optimization. So I was, I was terrified that I would disappoint him. But it is about robustness. Um, and it's different, different ways to get, to get robustness. So the basic story is that, uh, and, and we've seen it in, in many talks uh, already, that we collect data from somewhere, from some process. It could be an experiment. It could be a survey. It could be from online, it could be from wherever. And even though we collect it from heterogeneous sources, sometimes of, of ill repute, when we see XY, we believe that it really is XY when we, when we build our algorithms. Um, and particularly in, uh, in high dimensional regression, which is the topic of this, uh, of this talk, this happens all the time. There's not that much work that deals with uh, different types of corruption in um, in, in your data. Okay, so, so this is, uh, this is, this is uh, at a glance what this, what this talk is about. So here, here's a setting that I'll, I'll be talking about. The, when, I think, when I say a point, I really imagine it's a vector x, which you can think about as, which is going to be the, the row of, of your matrix, and the response variable y. And of course the point of regression is to try to find a linear relationship between, uh, between those two. Okay, so y equals x beta plus, plus some noise. And I, and I should mention, and, I, and I'll try to remember to keep mentioning, that for this talk, I'm actually assuming that everything here is stochastic. So I'm assuming that I have uh, sub-Gaussian variables everywhere. Okay, so I'm not going to, I don't need to assume RIP or restricted eigenvalue conditions or anything like that. And, and of course, because of, that's a slightly easier setting than giving deterministic guarantees. Okay, so all the guarantees will be, with high probability. Uh, but at the same time, sub-Gaussian is a, is a reasonably general class. It's not that outrageous. Um, and I, I think probably everyone here is, uh, is familiar with the basic, the basic setting in, in high dimensional regression. What we'd like to do is estimate, we have a very few points to estimate a linear relationship between uh, a high dimensional, high number of uh, of, uh, of, of covariates. So basically, we want to estimate beta star, which is an RP, and we typically think about P as being very, very large. We have N measurements, and N is much, much less than P, and the typical scaling that, that we're all used to seeing is N is equal to some constants that relate to the setup of the problem, but essentially N is equal to K times log P, and that's what I'll, I'll, uh, um, that's what I'll stick to. Uh, now. And what we care most about, or what I care most about, is finding the support of, of this unknown beta star. But of course, I'm on that support, then my, my second goal will be to, to uh, minimize some measure of loss. In this case, I'll care about L2 loss, but uh, there are other things that we might, uh, we might care about. And there's tons of applications in, in the literature too vast to, uh, to cite, and probably I think everyone is, is familiar with it. Um, I want to mention two leading approaches because they'll be recurrent in this, uh, in this talk. Um, one is lasso, which seeks to minimize the L2 loss plus, uh, plus an L1 penalty on beta. And the other one is a greedy algorithm called orthogonal matching pursuit, which sequentially and greedily adds elements to the support. And these are two of probably, I think it's fair to say, the most common algorithms that you see, these and, and variants of them. So this is what I'll be talking about. So of all the literature here, how much of it addresses the question, the, the situations when X 
has noise, or x has missing variables, or perhaps x has rows or entire um, entries or entire rows that are corrupted in some arbitrary way, possibly malicious way. Um, and that, as far as I know, there are very few such results, and I'll, and I'll talk about the ones that I'm aware of. But, um, but this is the vein in which uh, I want you to uh, understand the results that I'll, I'll talk about here. Okay, so, so the goal is that I, I'd like to be uh, robust to corruption. And as I mentioned, there's three primary, um, there's three primary types of corruption that I'm going to think about. The first is, is uh, stochastic. And again, two, two flavors of stochastic corruption. One is noise. So in this case, um, you still have your same process. Y is equal to X beta plus, plus noise plus E. But you, don't get to, you get to see y, but you don't get to see x. You get to see a noisy version or of, of x, or a version of x that has erasures. I don't really know how to denote erasures, so I'm, and I'll just, just because they're very similar in terms of analysis, I'm, I'm going to end up talking about the noisy version. Um, but you can do both. So what you get to see is x plus w. Okay? <clears throat> Um, but you could also think about more pernicious types of, uh, of uncertainty. Um, so one, one might be um, that you have all arbitrarily corrupted samples. So remember that what I called a sample was xi comma y, meaning um, an entire row of, of x and then and, and the output. So uh, one way we could write this is that what you're allowed to see is not x and y as a standard setup, but some x plus delta and some y plus little delta where, where this little delta comma big delta are completely arbitrary other than the fact that they're row sparse. That's one way to write this, this model. Um, so, so this is another model that I'm going to consider. And then a third is an even more difficult one where now um, looking, at, looking at this model where we, have, where we get to see x plus cap delta and y plus little delta, now capital delta and little delta are no longer going to be required to be row sparse, but just sparse. So instead of having n1 rows completely corrupted, every column of x is going to have n1 entries corrupted. So that's, that's certainly a, a more powerful adversary than, than, than the other one. Okay, so um, I don't know how much time I'll have. I'm going to spend, I'm going to try to do a thorough job on one and then uh, before, before all my slides for two and three, I prepared one kind of summary slide of the punchline. So maybe we'll just get, we'll just get to, uh, to that. Okay, so in pictures, here's, here it is one more time. So here's the ordinary setting. We get to see y is equal to x times beta. I guess I should have also drawn plus noise. So the three, the three models I'll look at are the case where x is noisy, and this is what you get to see, or x is row corrupted. So he, these are these I'll call authentic samples, and these are corrupted samples. And again, corrupted means the adversary is not restricted in magnitude, not restricted in computation, not restricted in absolutely any way, other than this way, other than this, the fact that he has only n1 uh, samples that he can corrupt. And then similarly for for the case where um, where just n1 elements of each column of x and y are corrupted. Okay, so th these are the three, the three models. And, uh, and here's the kind of basic punchline for, for this talk. So the algorithms that I'll present are simple in the sense that they're no more complicated than orthogonal matching pursuit. Um, they're greedy. And the goal is to identify support and bound the L2 error. So for the noisy and missing data, there's two, there's two results of interest. The first is that you can get support recovery if, if, if your X is noisy and missing without having, without having any knowledge whatsoever of the noise. Other than, of course, this will fail if it's not sub-Gaussian. Okay, so you don't need to know anything about that noise and you still get support recovery. Okay, so there's, I want to contrast this with another, with other best algorithm that I know of that that does the best uh, in terms of guarantees, and that algorithm has to know what has to know what the magnitude is of the noise. But I don't have to know what the magnitude of the noise is. As long as that magnitude is less than what the theorem prescribes, you're going to succeed. But your algorithm doesn't take that as input. 
though it's, it's, it's uh, oblivious to the noise. And you can't get, um, you can't get the coefficients without having some knowledge, or I don't know how to get the coefficients without having some knowledge of the noise. So if at least you have, if you know the noise, uh, I'm sorry, if you know the noise covariance, or, or if you have some partial knowledge, and I'll explain exactly what I mean by that, then you can get uh, some bounds on, on the L2 error. Then you can start filling in those coefficients. But the, for the support, you can be completely oblivious. So I'll also show you, again, depending on the uh, time, um, how a, a different version of orthogonal matching pursuit, or robust orthogonal matching pursuit, um, that, uh, that gives guarantees when there are arbitrarily corrupted samples. And I have nothing to compare this to because these are the only results that I'm, that I'm aware of um, in this setting. And similarly, uh, for the case where there's arbitrary and sparse corruption, again, I'm not aware of any other, um, of any other results. If you are, I'm, this is something that I've, I've just started working on, so it's possible that, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm missing something and I'd be very eager to know about it. Okay, so this is, this is kind of the outline of what, uh, of what the, the results you'll see. And, um, and again, as I said, part one of the talk, and maybe the only part, I'll talk about noisy and missing data. And this is work with, with my student, Yudong. And then part two, um, I'll talk about adversarial corruption. And this is again with Yudong and, and also with, uh, with Shai. Okay, okay so, so I'll start off with part one, talking about missing and, uh, and noising data, and, and tell you a little bit about what, um, what people have done. So. Uh, Shu and Yu, uh, this is not a different Shu, um, uh, have, have considered a noisy case, but only in, a, in the low dimensional setting in an, an asymptotic analysis. That means that you have, you fix the dimension and you let your number of observations go to infinity. And in that context, you, get, you give uh, results. So that, that's not suitable, unfortunately, for if you're interested in doing a high dimensional regression. Um, there's been a convex optimization approach uh, by Rosenbaum and Tsibakov. Um, I'm not going to talk about this too much because the results there and also the EM approach by Stadler and Buhlmann, um, this is only for missing data. These two are both weaker than uh, the recent. So recent is like uh, two months ago, uh, is the final version, final upload to archive, um, latest version to upload, upload to archive by uh, by Poling Lowe and Martin Wainwright, um, which, is, which is, as far as I know, gives the best results for these two problems of, uh, of missing data and noisy data. Um, so here's, here's roughly what, uh, what they do. And, and I'll be, this paper was, um, so I, I end up comparing this to this paper a lot because these, this has the best results. But I don't, I, I don't mean to be adversarial with the paper. I, I, this, is actually, this was actually a motivating paper when we saw this. We thought, we just wondered whether we can do something similar with, with a simpler algorithm. So that was, that, this was kind of our, our starting point. Uh, a first version of this appeared in NIPS uh, in last, uh, last December. So what this, does, what this paper does is it takes a, it, it takes a lasso approach. Um, and it ends up solving a non-convex optimization, but uh, using, using just a projected gradient descent. And when you run projected gradient descent on a non-convex problem, you may not end up at the uh, global optimum. But nevertheless, they're able to show that even if they do get stuck at a, at a local minimum, that local minimum they show uh, is, is extremely close to the, to the global optimum. And this allows them to give guarantees. So both in the case of, of missing data um, and, and for noisy data. And so uh, the kind of two high-level main differences from what I'm presenting is that this, this algorithm uh, needs knowledge of, um, of expected value of W transpose W. It needs knowledge of the covariance of the noise. And just by, we investigated this in simulation, if they only have if they overestimate or underestimate, that's also quite bad. They, they, they do quite poorly. Okay, so, so in that sense, this word need comes in. Uh, one thing that we cannot handle uh, yet, um, that, that, they, that they do quite well, is that uh, in, in everything that I'll present, I have to I have, to have uh, independent columns, whereas they can, they can handle correlated columns. So that's, that's quite an interesting case 
um, that, that we won't discuss. Do they require a subversion? They do, yes. <clears throat> yeah, so, so the, the assumptions... The, the assumptions and, uh, and the guarantees are, uh, are as, of the, as of the latest uh, um, upload to archive, they're, they're identical. Okay, so, so, so these are the two main differences, other than the fact that, that the algorithms are, are completely different. So, so again, we were interested in, in understanding whether instead of trying to do a projected gradient on, a, on this non-convex problem, whether something simple like OMP, how, how well it would do. And I guess I gave away the punchline, which is that essentially it does exactly as well as, as this method, just by running, by running uh, something that's no more complicated than OMP. Okay, so, so what's our approach? Um, well, let me remind you what standard OMP is. I, I've said it in words, um, but, but here it is more explicitly. Again, you see y is equal to x beta plus e. This is, our, this, is our, this is our starting point. So what OMP does at every step, it keeps, it keeps, uh, it, it adds sup uh, one element to the support. And the element that it adds, uh, it adds greedily. Oops, this is a typo here. This W shouldn't be here. So what it would add is uh, that argument that maximizes the inner product between, between um, Y, or in fur further steps, the residual, uh, with, uh, with, a column of, with a column of x. And it augments the support by the one that, that did the best. And then it solves the regression on that limited set and then repeats the whole thing, replacing, updating the residual. So this is orthogonal matching pursuit. And as you can see, it basically requires um, computing inner products and then solving a very low dimensional regression. So what we're gonna do is um, we no longer get to see x, we get to see x plus y, and so we need to robustify this step. So we need to robustify the way that uh, we find the next element of the support, and we need to robustify the way that we solve the regression. And this is actually a general template for, for, uh, for this entire talk. So this is also what we do um, when, we have, uh, when we have adversarially corrupted um, columns, I'm sorry, adversary corrupted elements of, of x and y, but of course what we mean by robustify will, will have to be different. Okay, so again, what we get is, is distributionally oblivious and it's a simple algorithm just like OMP. Uh, this is true again for, for, the, for the adversarial part as well. What you'll see is that this is very much like OMP um, for, for this case. And also, it, 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 what we get is coincides with the best known recovery and L2 uh, error bounds. So here is the extremely simple algorithm. Step one, just pretend that nothing is wrong and just use OMP. Okay, so I hope you're not angry at me for uh, having taken already 17 minutes to say that you can just do OMP. You don't have to do anything fancy and you'll get support and you'll get it just as well as if you do this modified lasso plus projected gradient um, that this other paper does, and you're gonna do better than all those other papers that I mentioned. Well, just, just do OMP. Okay, so as promised, this is just like OMP. So this will get you the support. And then step two is solve a low-dimensional robust regression. So this, this, takes, this takes a little bit of modification. So the, the interesting part is, um, the, is, is just showing that, that in fact OMP is, is good enough to do this. It's, um, so this means that, so notice what, what's happening here. So when I say use OMP, I mean that the way that you compute the residual is going to be again pretending that nothing is wrong. So it's sort of obvious that, uh, or, or it's, not, it's certainly not surprising that if you wanted to estimate the next, the next, uh, the next atom, the next column to add to the support, you might as well just pretend that uh, that, that W isn't there. So why why is that natural to assume? Because because basically the noise is, is unbiased. 
So you might say you're just taking in the products. So that's, that's natural. But maybe what's surprising here is that even when you're computing the residual, it's also actually optimal to do, uh, to do this. Um, so that, that's not unbiased. There, there are other things that you could do. And then after you compute the support, you, you basically redo your final computation in a more clever way in order to get, uh, in order to get good L2 bounds. Okay, so here's, um, so here's why, here are, the, here are the specific results so you can, you can see the numbers. Um, and, and the basic result says, again, everything, everything inside is, uh, is, uh, is sub-Gaussian um, and N0 mean. Um, so if N is bigger than 1 plus the, uh, plus the variance of W squared, um, times k log p, and you have this guarantee on, uh, on, the, on the lowest value of beta star, the lowest non-zero value, the magnitude, then you recover the support of beta star with high probability. So, uh, yeah, so there's, there's no price, I, I guess you, you, you can check the paper later, um, or just take my word for it, that, that, this is, that this is exactly what you get even if you use a different, uh, different method. So you're not paying, you're not paying an extra, extra price. So here is the basic proof idea, proof sketch. It, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of steps, which I'll spare you and, and just tell you the kind of main, main ideas. It's, it, it all follows from um, just carefully using some concentration inequalities. So the key workhorse lemma is showing that if A and B are sub-Gaussian matrices, then the product, B transpose A, is close to its expectation in a uniform way. Okay, so so uniformly over all V and W, this thing is, is going to be small. And, um, and that's going to be true with, with exponential probability. And so the way you prove that is that you prove it for a fixed V and W. And then um, you can use an epsilon net over, uh, over balls in, um, in Rk and Rm, which is uh, which is where v and, v and W will live. So this is this is something that we end up having to use um, repeatedly. And so then the proof of a the theorem goes as follows. Um, so after d iterations, you have some current support set. So uh, we proceed by induction and assume that at step d you've you've identified correctly uh, the first the first d component. So we basically want to see. Uh, we want to prove that the next component we choose is going to be the correct one. So, so what happens after d iterations? You've, you've computed this support set. So the inductive, the inductive assumption is that it's a subset of the script i, which is the true support set. You compute your residual. This is not going to be the right residual because I'm computing it using the noisy, using the noisy versions. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I think maybe I didn't tell you what z was. z is x plus w. So the point is that this, this is not the right residual. And, uh, and so you need, so part of, the, part of the problem is trying to keep track of how that error might potentially propagate. Um, and then what you add is whatever element is biggest in terms of inner product between one of your noisy columns and this residual, which might not be the right residual. Okay, so what we have to show is that, uh, is that the largest inner the largest inner product among elements in the correct set that you haven't added is bigger than every single other element um, when you take this inner product. And this is why we need the, the workhorse lemma, and this is why you need these uniform concentration bounds. So one comment that I want to make is that uh, maybe because I'm just rushing over things or, uh, or I'm convincing or you're very smart, um, but may maybe this sounds very straightforward, but just in uh, 2011, there was a paper published in uh, Transactions of Information Theory, OMP for Sparse Signal Recovery with Noise, where uh, some of these uniform concentration bounds are, are not used. And the consequence is that, that the proof there is, is essentially not correct. And, and, uh, and the reason is that there, is a, there are a few subtleties. So, for instance, um, there's noise that we add. Uh, the, the, the additive noise, this is the usual additive noise, not the, uh, not the noise that's added to the covariates, not the noise that's the central concern of this paper. This paper, 
was 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 looking at the, just the usual uh, the usual setting for um, for sparse regression. So the columns that you've selected are actually going to be dependent on so the the the, the columns even if z were not noisy. Um, that set of columns, even though the individual variables beforehand are independent of the noise, the fact that you've selected them all of a sudden creates a dependence with them in the noise. So going back to your work of right? Yeah. You need this completely dependent of the Epsilon net will be exponential in M and M, right? It will be exponential, of course. That's true. So, uh, I mean, if so, so not having complete independence means that means that uh, my x has a non-diagonal uh, covariance. Um, well, uh, also higher. Do they assume? I mean, you have to assume m the independence or something for this, right? Yes, I'm assuming that everything is they're independent. Yeah. I, I will. <laughs> um, but that, that's a, yeah, that's, um, they also don't deal with steps like this, but, but. But they will also be conditioning based on what they do in the step, so some of the argument is difficult. Yeah. They have the same algorithm? No, uh, these guys? Yeah. Yes, because I have the same algorithm. I'm just using OMP. So I, I have, I'm the one that has the same. Well, I mean, oh, they didn't invent OMP. Yeah, he, he's talking about uh, Pauling and uh, Martin's. Uh... I'm saying that as, that, that as far as I know, uh, as far as I can tell, the, the, this paper is incorrect. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it can't be patched up. But it's incorrect because, because it's slight, slightly subtle. Um, I mean that all of x, any entry in x, any column in x is independent of, of, the norm, of e. But all of a sudden, if you look at the columns that you chose at step d, that's no longer independent of, of the noise. Um, so I have a You said you didn't have to assume any bound in the covariance matrix. All you have to know is that it's something. So I, I, I hope I didn't say that. Um, so the uh, the uh, the theorem has has the covariance matrix in it. So I, I need to assume that there is a bound. I don't need to know it as an input to my algorithm. The, of, of course, of course. Um, wh whereas the other algorithm actually needs to know that. It, it's an input to the algorithm. And so, okay, so, so what, what's left at this point is to solve a, no, a low dimensional noisy regression. Because if we believe what, what I've said so far, it means that uh, if you just blindly run OMP, you're going to get uh, the right support. There's one other detail that I've swept under the rug uh, compared to other OMP results, and that's that I have no stopping condition. So I'm assuming that, um, I, that someone was nice enough to tell me the sparsity. So that's, that's something that's that's definitely needs to be uh, improved, um, and and it's and it's certainly a big uh, big assumption. But but that's uh, that's not something that we've that we've addressed right now. Yeah, so beta is a p vector, right? Beta is a vector in R p. That's and right. Yeah. So they're actually a little bit bigger than that. Yeah, in particular, yeah. So, so there's going to be there's going to be k non-zeros, and I'm and I'm assuming I know that k, so that I can run this algorithm, I can run this algorithm k times, and I know that k, and I stop because otherwise, how do I know that it's ten and not one hundred and ten? So yeah, so that that's something that uh, w w we need to take care of. Yeah. Using the standard compression and arguments also, so they also have. 
approximation algorithms when you have a little bit of noise, right? And uh, if you increase the number of samples, their approximation algorithms tend to also decrease. So have you so can you say so when you have a little bit of noise in, in the covariates? Um, no. So your measurement. Is noisy. Your measurement is noisy. Yeah. Even then, compress sensing will give you a uh, will recover a vector x up to some additive error. Right. Uh, and uh, that additive error goes down as you have more samples. So have you compared with like those direct? Well, this is the same R I P. Your matrix is. But uh, oh, it, my matrix is sub-Gaussian, so it will certainly Even satisfy. Before noise, so. Even before the noise. Yeah. So, so you were, what I was saying was that using those also you'll get some bounds. Right? So, but this, is, this isn't just additive noise. This isn't noise in your matrix. But that's correlated with the true beta star now. Again, those, uh, so those results are totally independent of what type of noise you have. They can just assume a certain level. Just certain level. Okay. Yeah. So, th so that that's true. You can you can do that. So those. So if you try to use deterministic results to get bounds for the stochastic case. Um, uh, I don't want to, my observation is, or any, any result I know that has tried to do that gets weaker results than necessary. So, for example, if you, if you tried to prove, yeah. So if you actually have sub-Gaussian noise, but that's independent from, from everything else, but you try to go through another avenue that uses deterministic results, uh, as far as I, I'm saying, as far as I know, because I'm not saying it as like a meta theorem, but I have not. I don't believe that you can get the. I believe that you lose something there, and certainly every result that I'm aware of that that as a corollary gives results to the noisy case using deterministic results is weaker. Um, but but you're but you're right that that it's worth seeing what you get when you just kind of. Push it in there, but but I would I would guess that you're not going to get the the same uh, the same strength of result. Um, okay, so for the for the low dimensional problem, we we no longer want to want to pretend that there's nothing going on. So we have a so this is what we think. Okay, the, the truth is that y is equal to x beta plus uh, plus noise, but but this is what we what we think. This is the only thing that we know. Um, and what we wish we could use is the answer, so because now we're in the low dimensional setting. So we wish we could put beta hat equal to x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. Okay, so we know that that's the answer. And the problem is that we don't know x transpose x and we don't know x transpose y. And so the answer of how to proceed is let's just replace these with some estimate of those. Okay, and this is where we, where we need some information about uh, some information about uh, about the about the noise. Okay, so so we're gonna we're gonna use some estimate sigma hat for x transpose x and some estimate gamma hat for x transpose y. And there's three cases of 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 interest. So the first, depending on what you know. So the first is that suppose that you know the uh, covariance of the noise, expected value of w transpose w. Then a natural thing to use for your estimate. Uh, instead of x transpose x, you should use z transpose z, and then just correct off by subtracting the, subtracting the expectation. So just incidentally, this is very close to what, uh, what, uh, what Poling and Martin do. Um, they run lasso, but modified by subtracting this off. And this is why you get non-convexity, because this is something that's, that's potentially, not potentially, that is going to be full rank. Whereas your matrix in the high dimensional setting, I'm in the low dimensional setting now. What they do is exactly this in the high dimensional setting. Your matrix x transpose, uh, z, x transpose x is, is going be, um, to be ranked efficient. So once you subtract this off, you're no longer going to have a positive semi-definite matrix inside your regression. And so you'll have a non-convex problem. So the, the, that's what they do and that's why they run into this non-convexity. 
So if you know, if you know the covariance of the noise, then, then this is a natural thing to do. You may not know that. You may, instead, you may know the covariance of, of x. So in that case, you can use this, and this also works. So there's a third way um, that's, uh, that, that economists sometimes use. They, they talk about having some knowledge of x, uh, not through its expectation, not through its moments, like, like these two first approaches, but through another set of variables called instrumental variables. So you can also use these. So uh, instrumental variables are some collection of, of random variables u that are somehow related to x. And of course, how closely they're, connect, they're related to x governs um, how good your results are going to be. So in this case, these are, these are natural estimators for, uh, for x transpose x and for x transpose, uh, x transpose y. So we can use all, all three of these flavors. Um, again, it depends, you know, you tell me what you know, and then this is, this is what you can use, and then subsequently you get, you get guarantees. So, uh, so for example, the kind of results we get are the following. So if x is known exactly and completely, not our setting, this is just for comparison, then uh, the L2 bounds look like, uh, look like this. So th these are the standard kind of state-of-the-art uh, bounds um, for low dimensional, um, low dimensional regression. And this is, so I tried to make it so you can see clearly how much we suffer from, uh, from not knowing x uh, directly. So what we show is that here are the, the I, I got a bit lazy last night and I, and I didn't write the third case. Um, but but it's, it's exactly analogous. So if you know, if you know the covariance of uh, of the noise, then, then this is the result you get. So you can compare the extra terms that you have uh, directly. And one thing to notice is that if the noise goes to zero, you actually recover exactly that, which is, which is one, uh, one result that you would, would want. That doesn't mean that this is the best possible, but it's at least, it's at least uh, something that you would want. And if you know, and if you know the covariance of x, you get something, something very similar. Note, however, that this, in this case, you don't recover um, you don't recover exactly uh, what we have on top. So, um, so in, in, in this sense, um, this suggests uh, these two, if you know both, then what you should do is you should use either one depending on what regime you're in. So if the strength of the noise is very large, then this is going to be, the, then, uh, then using uh, the covariance of the noise is actually weaker than using the covariance of x. And then vice versa, if, if the covariance, if the, if the strength of the noise is, is very small. Okay, so the final upshot is that with an extremely simple algorithm, we basically recover uh, what are the state-of-the-art um, results. And we also have results for instrumental variables. Um, and uh, and, uh, and I, I didn't show this here, but if you don't know sigma w, but you only have upper and lower bounds on it, you can also get, some, you can also get bounds on your recovery. Um, and again, support recovery is, is for support recovery, that's completely a distribution oblivious. And um, the results for missing variables are, are very much analogous to this. So that's the end of my part one, and, and as I suspected, it will be the only part, except for a brief summary of, uh, of, of the second part, but are there any any questions on this part? Um, yeah, so let me think about it for a second. So instrumental variables are something, so uh, in an economic setting, um, the columns of X are, are your features. So uh, they might be, um, they might be uh, certain, uh, certain features um, certain measurements you might make about, uh, about the economy, certain economic factors. Um, and so, okay, so what I'm trying to think online about is what would be the ones that you can't actually directly measure, but you have, you have a proxy for them, like you. Uh, so, for example, maybe unemployment is one, but all you can really measure is who declares that they're unemployed. Um, maybe I'm not giving out the, the 
you're right. I haven't actually worked on that, but um, but uh, but that's a, that's a spirit of uh, of instrumental variables. Oh, I, I had a few results. Th these just show these these are plots of uh, of of error. Um, and if you and if you uh, if you normalize or if you rescale, um, so that so that you kind of take out. Uh, th these are all indexed by, by different support sets. Then they actually line up very well and uh, in a linear way, which is exactly what the theory results um, show. These two lines uh, show, uh, are, show that for some reason that I can't exactly explain, empirically on this, uh, on this, uh, on this static problem, we're doing better than the, uh, than the lasso approach. So I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but not only is it a simpler algorithm, but at least in our, in our simulations, we're also doing, we also seem to be doing better empirically, even though theoretically we have the same, uh, the same guarantees. And this is, this is for different cases. If you know sigma w is a previous one, if you know sigma x, if you know, uh, if you know the uh, instrumental variables. This, is, this, is a, this slide shows that um, the support error when uh, in the left, when lasso underestimates the noise, and in the right, when lasso overestimates the noise, and you can see that in both cases, if the noise is very small, everyone is happy. But as soon as the noise gets big, if you're underestimating or overestimating, and you need that in, as an input to your algorithm, then you're not going to be very happy. Then you're not going to do well. And we do well throughout this entire range. These, these kind of low lines that go a little bit up right at the end, that's, that's us. Um, OK. If I, uh, I forget, but I'll tell you as soon as I look at my computer. Um, be like 300 to 500 if I recall, but this is something like that. I... Okay, so I think I'm over time, so let me just give you this, this one slide on, uh, on the setting where you have corrupted data. So again, this, is the, this setting seems to be a lot harder in terms of what you can deliver. Uh, and I'll tell you why I say that. So here's one thing that you could try. The natural brute force algorithm, if I tell you that you have 100 you, your matrix has 100 rows, and 10 of them are corrupted. And your support, your, your, uh, your, vec your beta has support on 10 elements. A brute force, the brute force algorithm that's natural would be to look, at, look over all subsets, all possible subsets of 90 rows, and all possible subsets of 10 columns, so all 90 by 10 matrices, and choose the one that, has the, that gives you the smallest regression error. This is a very. This is the. This is what I would call the natural. Of course, it's exponential time, but it's but it's a natural brute force algorithm. So if you do that, you might ask how many. Again, this is in the sub Gaussian, so very friendly setting. The sub Gaussian setting. How many outliers can you endure before you fail to correctly get back the support? So the number of outliers you can get is very very small. It's, it's, it's basically bounded by n over k. That's how it scales. That's not very nice because n is equal to k log p. Okay, so, you don't, so n over k is not, is, not, is not good. It's actually pretty bad. And another negative result is that any, neg any convex optimization based approach, which is something like this, fails. Which means that with even a few outliers, you don't even need that many, you're not going to recover the support. So there's, there's a very nice paper, actually a set of papers, where there's only corruption in Y, but not in X. And a convex approach called justice pursuit is shown to do very well and to recover a constant fraction of, of errors. But that's just not the case if you, if you start corrupting X. So the problem changes in, a, in, a, in an essential way. And so not only does, that, does justice pursuit fail, but any convex approach that has this form, where F and H are convex, will fail. And so what we show is a robust OMP algorithm, which I, unfortunately I won't be able to show you, ends up outperforming all of the above. So this was a bit of a surprise to us. It scales order-wise better. So n1 is actually less than n over square root of k instead of n over k. So this, this was uh, surprising. So I get to not give you any more details and just leave you with that. And I'll, and I'll just flip to the uh, conclusions and say that uh, there's a lot more to do and a lot more that I don't understand. Um, and, uh, and you can find out more by talking to me 
or uh, emailing, and paper is available online. Thank you.